So perhaps we see lower numbers of death for white women as compared to black women because the white women are cared for. We have to care for black women in this country in terms of maternal and child health. In terms of maternal mortality, we're still in the same boat, meaning that Black women are three times to four times more likely to die than white women. And that's essentially what the situation is. It's the way it has been. So black women are at risk when they have a baby. And unfortunately, uh, there aren't the normal factors that we can use to explain it. For example, if a black woman is educated and doing very well in terms of income, and perhaps uh, having a very successful position, she can still be at greater risk of dying when she has her baby than a white woman in the United States of America. Why does that happen? Because we have been told in terms of health disparities, if we fix socioeconomic status and all of those things, that health will improve. So there's some validity to that, but the reality is, is that Black women still experience maternal death at a greater rate. And we can look at Serena Williams as an example. When she had her baby, she had very, very serious complications. And luckily and fortunately, she's still alive. But that gives you an example um, that we can't bypass. I think we have to use the term racism. And we have to also look at structural and systemic oppression. So before a black woman even gets to the point of being pregnant, she has lived a life of stress in many instances. Through racial oppression, which occurs in a lot of different ways, small and big, at work, going to the grocery store, you know, just surviving, functioning, no matter your level, at, in the corporate environment, in the non-corporate environment, no matter where you are. And so she has been taking on all of that and fighting with it and struggling with it throughout her life, in college, in high school, you know, all through the educational system from K through 12 to higher ed. Um, especially if she has attended a predominantly white institution. If she's attended schools where they are under-resourced, the struggle is there and she's constantly feeling it. Sometimes it's subconsciously experiencing it and knowing it's there and feeling it and expressing it. And others are saying, oh, maybe, maybe it wasn't racism, maybe it was something else. But she's feeling this onslaught. So this is manifesting in her psyche. This is manifesting in her body. Now you get to the point of carrying a child. What happens in the medical environment? Well, why would we believe in any way, shape or form that what has happened throughout our lives would change just because we're in a medical establishment? Why would we think all of a sudden we go in there and Everything is glorious in the same society. At the time, in the moment where you're having your baby, there's a sense of vulnerability of turning yourself over to let individuals take care of you. But you have to be listened to. And so you have to put all of this together and then try to sort out what's happening and have very candid discussions about it. So some of the stories that I've listened to and read and heard and written about and et cetera. They're horrific stories of families just beginning, being very excited, having taken all the appropriate steps and so forth, and they get to the hospital and, and something terrible happens.
uh, because they're not listened to and they're not respected and they're not trusting who's caring for them. If you look at Harriet Washington's book, Medical Apartheid, I highly recommend it. Because we have a tendency to just look at certain cases and we iterate those over and over and over and not understand that over a very long period of time from slavery um, onward, Black people were subjected to experimentation. Consequently, Black women were included in that process of experimentation. And yes, it was felt that, and it's still felt in many instances that Black women can handle more pain. They may not get the same kind of care as their white counterparts. And this helps us to understand, of course, we have to take other factors into consideration. We have to take health disparities in general into consideration. Because we do have uh, greater rates of chronic illnesses in the Black community, but that's a story that has been around for a very, very long time and also has not changed because of stress, racism, because of structural oppression, all of those things. You put all of that together and what is the salient factor underneath all of that? It is not race. It is about socioeconomic status. When you don't have access to the kind of foods that you need to eat, when you're experiencing health illiteracy, when the schools in your neighborhood are under-resourced, when the healthcare facilities in your neighborhoods are under-resourced. And if they are there, they are perhaps doing things that we are talking about, not listening to what you're saying. When you come to a healthcare facility, lack of cultural competency, lack of diverse healthcare practitioners, So we go through all of these factors and you put it all together and you realize that we're really talking about the same problem, except when it comes to maternal mortality, we get this unique situation that goes on in which if you remove the socioeconomic status issue from the picture, black women still suffer at a greater rate than other groups. And that's when we have to consider very pointedly racism and the onslaught of that racism and what it has done to the woman's body so that she can be strong and healthy at the point of birth. And it takes a lot. I've had two. <laughs> My children have grown, but I absolutely understood and understand what it takes to have a baby, to be pregnant and bring it all the way to the end and then deliver that baby and to do so in the way that you want to do it. Because we also have to look at C-section rates. That's a factor that contributes to maternal mortality. If we go back to during slavery, Black women used to do all the delivering of the babies. They were the midwives. They delivered the Black babies and they delivered the white babies. That was a situation where babies were born very healthy. It was done naturally. And when it was time for a woman to deliver, they would say, go and get the midwife. The midwife in those times would be largely black women. And the reality is that black women were moved out of the birthing process in terms of delivery. When the process was licensed, when OBGYNs took over, when white men became the dominant forces in this field and started delivering babies. Everything changed. So there's a historical discussion around this that I think is really important in order to fully understand it. And so black women lost their power in the birthing process. 
And you need power when you're going through what is happening to your body. You need strength and you need to be able to do it on your own terms. That has been lost. Studies have shown throughout history that uh, Black people and just people in general are more comfortable being cared for by people who look like them. I mean, it, it's obvious. With that being said, of course, we need to diversify. And this is why we have diversity, equity, and inclusion. These, the DEI concept, which is emerging now, as if it's new, by the way. When I was a student at Yale University at the School of Public Health, uh, we were talking about these exact same things. And I took maternal mortality uh, focused courses and women's health and so forth. And then I moved out of that, went to Columbia University and you know, got my doctorate there. And we were talking about the exact same thing. Then I became a professor, teaching it in my courses, developed courses around the topic and so forth wrote books about the subject matter. I mean, all in. But if I were to be very truthful about this, it hasn't changed. And that is very painful because you do your work, you're committed to it. And people constantly want to talk about the problems. We have to talk about solutions. We cannot continue to reiterate this problem without getting to the solutions. Because without the solution, Black women are dying when they're giving birth at rates three to four times higher than their white counterparts. We already know why. We, the why is clear. People in the field of public health and medicine, they know that this is going on. It's not a secret, it's, it's a reality but it doesn't always rise to the level of the public eye. I was pretty excited in recent scenarios when we began to talk about health disparities. And this was a deep dive back into that to talk about it rather than money allocated to fix it, policies created to change it, diversification of healthcare facilities, medical schools, public health programs, all of those things. It has to happen with a great deal of intensity in order for it to be solved. Policy vantage point, I think the allocation of resources is step number one. And the question is what can be done Some of the solutions are not terribly complicated. For example, let's use one. For Black women, if they could have doula support during their pregnancy and after the pregnancy, and this can be covered by their insurance, that would be great. Because the problem is that Black women oftentimes do not have the kind of support that they need when they are going through the process of being pregnant during the delivery and then afterwards to help take care of the baby because all of this requires money. And so there needs to be a focus on providing that kind of support. Also, just in terms of healthcare in general, I think there needs to be overall better quality healthcare. So we can compare this to education. If you have under-resourced schools, clearly the children are not going to be as educated. If you have under-resourced healthcare facilities or lack of access to those facilities, or if you do have access, it's not diverse and they're not listening to what you have to say or understanding you culturally and et cetera, then that's not working. We need to really closely look at the healthcare facilities that are serving Black women as they are in the process of having babies and post-delivery, that often gets left out. What happens if the woman is successful and does not die during the process of having her baby? What happens with her care immediately afterwards? Because that's really important too. Um, so it, it's a very holistic approach to this. And I don't think we can politic our way out of this. We can hear lip service, to it and we know that it's happening 
And I know that there was a Black maternal mortality caucus organized uh, by the Congressional Black Caucus. So we have to give them credit for that. But now what we want and must have is allocation of real dollars toward this. Once that happens, you can see change. And once we recognize and acknowledge what the root causes are, we can address this with the providers that are providing care to Black women. We can address this through cultural competency training to address some of their biases that they might not recognize because they might think, well, I am listening. You know, when, when she comes in, uh, I'm hearing what she's saying and so forth. But the question is, are you really hearing it? And if you're hearing it, do you know how to interpret what you're hearing? Do you understand what Black people eat? Do you understand what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you know what it feels like to be a Black woman in America? What does it feel like? And this is not to say that it's all negative because there's a lot of joy. We don't want to paint this image that Black women are just drudging around unhappy and there's no joy and so forth. That's not the way it is. It's subtle. There are subtle assaults that we experience within race and outside of our race. So this is what has to be understood. So if you have a Black woman doctor taking care of you and you're pregnant, she probably gets it because she's experiencing it. And therefore, you can have a better conversation with her and she'll understand, perhaps. I think you'll have a better shot of her understanding than someone who is not Black. I experienced this as a professor. In, as a professor, um, in many <laughs> institutions that I taught in, I would have Black women students who would say to me, you're the first Black professor that I ever had. And this is amazing. And they would just come to my office during office hours and they would tell me about what was going on in their lives on campus. And I understood. I was like, girl, I get it. <laughs> like, I absolutely understand where you're coming from. And so what did this do in the classroom? This enabled those same, and I'm using Black women as an example, but this also happened with my Black male students. But this enabled us to connect and this enabled them to have someone that they could come to, that I'm going to go and talk to Dr. Rose or to feel comfortable asking me questions in class without feeling, mm, I don't know if I should ask that question because you know you could ask me that question and that I could answer it coming from a space of understanding and experiential knowledge. So this is what is needed when you are having a baby, one of the most personal things that can happen to you in your life and also one of the most powerful things that can happen to you in your life. Because it can be a very wonderful and powerful experience, but it has to be in the right vein because if not, a lot of things can go wrong and you can lose control very quickly and lose your life. So I think that that's the difference. And so yes, that, that's very important when we look at maternal mortality um, having a Black woman care for you can make a real difference. I believe so. I taught at a university in the medical school. And the reason why is because the, all of the students, I won't even say some of them, all of the students were white in this particular course that I was teaching. And I was asked to do so by the dean of the medical school because I was a professor in public health. And I was asked, can you teach in the medical school because our students are gonna go out and they're gonna work in communities of color. And most of them have never encountered communities of color. And so I was asked to teach them 
how to be culturally competent. And the first day that I walked into that classroom, I had an appointment now in the medical school. And I came in at that time, we were still using overhead projectors. So the guy brought in the overhead projector, I went in and started setting things up and so forth. And the students were chatting amongst each other and I can hear them saying, I wonder when the professor is coming to class because you know, they just assumed that I was part of the audiovisual crew there setting that up. And I just heard them talking and it just wasn't dawning on them in any way whatsoever that I was going to be that professor that was gonna teach them. And I wrote my name on the board, I turned around and introduced myself. Wow, the faces. Do not make assumptions. You, without even knowing anything about me at all, you looked at me and you made an assumption that, well, she can't possibly be the professor in this medical school. It turns out that these students were in dire need of cultural competency uh, training. They were in dire need of understanding and what I found was that they wanted to understand because they were very nervous about going into the communities that they were about to go in. They, they didn't know what to do. They didn't understand things. And some of the questions that they would ask just seemed off the wall, but it was because they had not had the opportunity to be around black people, people of color. They just hadn't, it just didn't happen in their lives. And when they were around them, they were around them in a very superficial way, not caring for them. You know, like, oh, I, I have black friends and so forth. Yes, you do, but now you have to care for the bodies of black people. So let's dig in, let's understand. And I think this is what is missing, you know, and then you find out what those biases are, what those belief systems are, what they think about Black people, how having a relationship with a Black person is not the same as caring for a Black person's body and delivering a baby from a Black woman. I mean, some things that I've heard, I've given lectures uh, as a keynote speaker or consultant or workshop presenter to a room full of white practicing physicians and not in all cases because of course not everyone is this way but i have heard some things that have been shocking in terms of their commentary and what they believe so yes this must be done and we have to have candid conversations about it and i'm very proud of those universities and schools that take the steps to do this when you call me to bring me in as a consultant to talk to your predominantly white institution about cultural diversity and competency and proficiency, I'm proud of you because you're taking a step. Because when I come in, it's gonna get real. We're gonna really go in. And that's what needs to happen. And it doesn't have to be done in a belligerent way. It's education and it has to happen for our healthcare providers. Because everybody can't be Black that's providing the care. There's just not enough people to be able to do it. So we need to diversify and we need to educate. So I start with finding terms like emerging majority instead of using the term minority and helping them to understand that numbers are changing and that you better get very real about this because the population is such that you're not gonna always be the majority. You're gonna be the minority. So let's start there. And that's always pretty shocking. And then I really get into a deep dive in terms of culture without um, stereotyping because there's a lot of stereotypes. So I use exercises. I, I do something called the assumption exercise where I show them pictures of all different kinds of people that might come into their facility. And I let them anonymously write down their first impression of that individual and it's shocking. For example, you, I would put a, a black man that has locks and 
you'll hear stuff like he's a drug dealer, all kinds of crazy things. And then they find out that that individual is actually a professor and an author and all of that. But then we also break down, but if you thought that the person was a drug dealer versus a professor, et cetera, would you treat that person differently? And then we have to go into that level. In that same exercise, um, there's, there's one example of this white girl and she's, you know, just looking all pristine and so forth. And they automatically assume that she's a college student and all that. Well, she actually was the drug dealer in that assumption exercise. And they're floored. And I'm saying, but why are you floored though? You know, because let's look at the statistics about who is actually using drugs in our country and to what degree. So when I say I go in, I really do go in. I go through various cultures and explain to them what people eat. I explain to them that not all Black people are the same in terms of even though we might be racially the same, we have different cultures. So if you're from Haiti or the Bahamas or from Queens, New York versus South, down in Georgia, you know, we, we're not the same. You know, there's a lot of differences. And it's just shocking to me what I have to break down and how surprised people are about what I am saying. And I know that it has to be done. These sessions are long, sometimes they're week long. I've been hired to come into a, an institution to do a week long or two week session or to do a keynote or to come in and do visual assessments because you can go into a waiting room of a facility and they have paintings on the walls and so forth and they have magazines and, and they're predominantly serving a black community and there's not a black thing on the wall or a magazine on the table or anything. You're just not even visually affirming. And so I will help an organization to understand that in your waiting room, you're not speaking to them. Visual affirmation um, is very, very important. And of course, I talk about the microaggressions that might be happening, things that you are saying and doing that you're not intentionally trying to harm people, but you are by what you're saying and doing, by telling people you need to just change your diet without understanding the history, for example, just using it as an example, because not everyone eats soul food, but some Black people do eat soul food. Where did that come from? Why are black Americans eating soul food, which in some preparations is largely unhealthy. It's because it was the refuse garbage food that the slave masters fed to slaves and they had to make it tasty, pass it on from generation to generation. And now it's part of the culture. And I explained to them how I grew up eating soul food. And it wasn't until very much later in my life that I found out that, oh, I need to modify this. I'm not going to stop eating it completely because there's a lot of it that I enjoy, but I have to modify this. It's not about socioeconomic status per se exclusively. It's about culture within a race and how that's passed on and what it means to us. If you have a person that walks in and you have dietary and nutritional information that will be better for them, you can't just say to them, oh, change your diet. You're eating badly. No, you have to understand why, how, what happened, and then work with them to come to a better place for their physical bodies. Until resources are allocated in the communities that need it, then it's not gonna change. So it's a very severe problem. And I think that is why we don't see real change because we can do so within the context of the structural oppression and we can see some improvements, but we're not gonna see vast improvement because it's just gonna repeat itself over and over and over and over. And having looked at this very closely, I believe that this is a nationwide problem. And so that's why on the cover of my book, I have a map of the United States of America.
this is a national problem. And in some states, it's more pervasive than others, but it really has to do with resources. And until that changes on the policy level, we're not going to see a real difference. And, and that sounds less than optimistic, um, but I am optimistic. Most disturbing to me is that Black women are dying while trying to have a baby in the United States of America, in a nation where maternal mortality overall is awful relative to other industrialized nations, and that we still are in a position of getting blank stares from people <laughs> when you explain to them that they're not being heard. It's intolerable. It's just unacceptable. You cannot blame Black women for their demise when you're caring for them. They are coming to you for care and dying. Your job is to resolve that, not to perpetuate it. You are taking an oath that says, first, do no harm. And so if you've cared for me throughout my entire pregnancy, and then I die at the table, some would say, well, they're not going for their prenatal care and so forth. Well, then once again, it is your job to find out why these women aren't getting prenatal care. And it is your job to rectify that. It's not their job because they're the patient. It's your job. If you go to medical school because you want to care for people, you don't want your patients dying. There's no other field where that would be okay, where we would buy cars, right? And all the cars don't work. And we would be saying to the manufacturers and the you know, mechanics and so forth, what are you all doing? Because everybody has cars and they're not working. We would hold them accountable. So we need to hold the practitioners accountable for the deaths of black women who are having babies and dying. You must care for your body as best as you possibly can. Try to get information, look at many sources. And I think one area that's overlooked for a lot of black women but is not overlooked for white women, particularly wealthy women, is midwifery. Because I think that midwives take a very holistic approach to the birthing process. Look at the whole concept of a doula. Try to get as much information as possible. But this is a complicated thing for me to say because if you have no idea of what I'm saying prior to it happening, then it would be very challenging for you to take that on for yourself. If you're in a low income community that's not heavily resourced, no one's reaching out and trying to share this information then how do you begin to have the information? So there needs to be a community effort to try to reach out to community members and provide them with information on a broader basis. And then once this kind of scenario is set up, we can communicate more effectively with pregnant women. And this should start happening with Black women when they're very, very young. No, not just teaching them about the parts of the body in a sex ed class and how it works, but teaching them everything about how to care for yourself, what kind of options are out there, how to eat healthy. All of those things should be taught that you may and perhaps are experiencing racism. And what does that feel like for you? Mental health. How do you process what happens to you as a young woman on a daily basis, the assaults that we experience? How do we handle that? So it has to be very holistic. You're not gonna be talking to young girls necessarily directly about pregnancy when they're little, but you can talk to them about loving yourself and understanding when you're not being cared for and empowering yourself. It has to start early. And then once a woman is pregnant, you can really go in on all of these things and making sure that she's getting the vitamins that she needs. Can she afford to get those vitamins that she needs? 
and how that plays into it. There's just so much, but I truly in my heart and soul believe that it can be done. Because when you care about people, you, you love them into a beautiful birth instead of death. And so perhaps we see lower numbers of death for white women as compared to black women because the white women are cared for. We have to care for black women in this country in terms of maternal and child health.